Disclaimer. This material is for entertainment purposes only, and for no other purpose. Please consult a legal professional for proper legal advice, including understanding what this document means. Please consult the actual document for all legal uses. This presentation is no substitute for the actual document. We cannot help you if you do not follow this simple, reasonable, and good advice. Please let us know about any errors in this presentation so that we can correct them. Unfortunately, we cannot and will not correct any errors made in the underlying documents, so please make sure the error is a presentation error. Thank you very much for your time, support, and interest. We hope you enjoy this content. Sponsors. Unfortunately, there are no video sponsors or channel sponsors at this time. If you would like to sponsor us, please reach out. All donations are welcome. Thank you. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and share this video with others. Doing this will help us reach other interested people, and will help to support this channel. We appreciate your action. Thank you. Forward, Speaker of the House. The last best hope of Earth. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, that I take this obligation freely, without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter, so help me God. All members of the United States Congress take this sacred oath. On January 6, 2021, Democrats and Republicans agreed that we would fulfill this oath, and that we had an obligation to signal to the world that American democracy would prevail. In furtherance of fulfilling this duty, the Select Committee to investigate the January 6 attack on the United States Capitol was charged with investigating the facts, circumstances and causes that led to this domestic terror attack on the Capitol, the Congress and the Constitution. We owe a debt of gratitude to Chairman Benny Thompson, Vice Chair Liz Cheney, the patriotic members of Congress and dedicated staff, who devoted themselves to this investigation, to uncovering the truth and to writing a report that is a roadmap for justice. The Select Committee to investigate the January 6 attack has succeeded in bringing clarity and demonstrating with painstaking detail the fragility of our democracy. Above all, the work of the Select Committee underscores that our democratic institutions are only as strong as the commitment of those who are entrusted with their care. As the Select Committee concludes its work, their words must be a clarion call to all Americans, to vigilantly guard our democracy and to give our vote only to those dutiful in their defense of our Constitution. Let us always honor our oath to, as Abraham Lincoln said, nobly save, or meanly lose, the last best hope of earth. So help us God. Nancy Pelosi. Speaker of the House. Forward, Chairman. We were told to remove our lapel pins. At the start of every new Congress, House members are presented with lapel pins. They are about the size of a quarter and carry a seal of a bald eagle. On a routine day in the Capitol, there are thousands of tourists, advocates, and workers. Typically, the pins are an easy way to spot House members. However, on January 6, 2021, the pin that once was a badge of honor and distinction turned into a bullseye. On that day, tear gas fog the air as gunfire rang out and a violent mob crashed against the sealed doors. Concerned for our safety, Capitol Police officers told us that our lapel pins would make us a target for rioters. As the Capitol Police rushed members of Congress and staff to safety, that simple and, in context, sensible warning stuck with me. On January 6, 2021, my colleagues and I came to work with the intent of fulfilling our oaths of office and constitutional duty to carry out the peaceful transfer of power. We were the people's representatives in the people's house doing the people's business. Sadly, on that day, the danger was too great for our work to continue and for us to remain in the capital. It was too dangerous to be identified as a representative of the American people. I've been a member of the House for nearly 30 years. In that time, there's not a day that goes by that I don't feel a profound sense of duty and responsibility to the men and women who sent me to Congress to be their voice. After all, I'm from a part of the country where, in my lifetime, 
black people were excluded entirely from political processes. Jim Crow laws prevented my father from registering to vote, and tragically during his life, he never cast a vote. For generations, the people in communities I represent have struggled to have their voices heard by their government. Therefore, I take my duties and responsibilities seriously, advocating for greater economic opportunity, robust infrastructure, better schools, and safer housing for my constituents. However, that long struggle to overcome oppression and secure basic civil and human rights continues to be my highest priority. I am always mindful of the journey that brought me to Washington as a member of Congress to be the voice of the women and men of Mississippi. As a violent mob stormed the Capitol trying to take away people's votes, rioters carried the battle flag from a failed rebellion of Confederate states. This moment resonated deeply with me because of my personal history. Additionally, I continually think about the ongoing struggle to ensure justice and equality for all Americans. The Capitol building itself is a fixture in our country's history, of both good and bad. After all, this structure is among the most recognizable symbols of American democracy. The Capitol's shining dome, topped with the statue of Goddess Freedom, was built partially by the labor of enslaved people in the 18th and 19th centuries. Dark chapters of America's history are written into the building's marble, sandstone, and mortar. And yet in the halls and chambers of this building, leaders of courage passed amendments to our Constitution and enacted the laws that banned slavery, guaranteed equal rights under the law, expanded the vote, promoted equality, and moved our country, and her people, forward. The Capitol building itself is a symbol of our journey toward a more perfect union. It is a temple to our democracy. Those great moments in our history have come when men and women put loyalty to our country and constitution ahead of politics and party. They did the right thing. The work of the select committee certainly originates from the same tradition. Our bipartisan membership has moved politics to the side and focused on the facts, circumstances, and causes of January 6th. When I think back to January 6th, after nearly a year and a half of investigation, I am frightened about the peril our democracy faced. Specifically, I think about what that mob was there to do, to block the peaceful transfer of power from one president to another based on a lie that the election was rigged and tainted with widespread fraud. I also think about why the rioters were there, besieging the legislative branch of our government. The rioters were inside the halls of Congress because the head of the executive branch of our government, the then President of the United States, told them to attack. Donald Trump summoned that mob to Washington, D.C. Afterward, he sent them to the Capitol to try to prevent my colleagues and me from doing our constitutional duty to certify the election. They put our very democracy to the test. Trump's mob came dangerously close to succeeding. Courageous law enforcement officers put their lives on the line for hours while Trump sat in the White House, refusing to tell the rioters to go home, while watching the assault on our republic unfold live on television. When it was clear the insurrection would fail, Trump finally called off the mob, telling them, we love you. Afterward, Congress was able to return to this Capitol building and finish the job of counting the Electoral College votes and certifying the election. This is the key conclusion of the Select Committee, all nine of us, Republicans and Democrats alike. But who knows what would have happened if Trump's mob had succeeded in stopping us from doing our job? Who knows what sort of constitutional gray zone our country would have slid into? Who would have been left to correct that wrong? As required by House Resolution 503, which established the Select Committee, we've explored in great detail the facts, circumstances, and causes of the attack. This report will provide new details that supplement those findings the committee already presented during our hearings. But there are some questions for which there are still no clear answers, even if all the facts, circumstances, and causes are brought to bear. The what if? Questions. For the good of American democracy, those questions must never again be put to the test. So, while it's important that this report lays out what happened, it's just as important to focus on how to make sure that January 6th was a one-time event, to identify the ongoing threats that could lead us down the dangerous path again with hopes and humble prayers that the committee's work is carried on through corrective action. This report will provide greater detail about the multi-step effort devised and driven by Donald Trump to overturn the 2020 election and block the transfer of power.
Building on the information presented in our hearings earlier this year, we will present new findings about Trump's pressure campaign on officials from the local level all the way up to his vice president, orchestrated and designed solely to throw out the will of the voters and keep him in office past the end of his elected term. As we've shown previously, this plan faltered at several points because of the courage of officials, nearly all of them Republicans, who refused to go along with it. Donald Trump appeared to believe that anyone who shared his partisan affiliation would also share the same callous disregard for his or her oath to uphold the rule of law. Fortunately, he was wrong. The failure of Trump's plan was not assured. To the contrary, Trump's plan was successful at several turns. When his scheme to stay in power through political pressure hit roadblocks, he relentlessly pushed ahead with a parallel plan, summoning a mob to gather in Washington, D.C. on January 6, promising things will be wild. That mob showed up. They were armed. They were angry. They believed the big lie that the election had been stolen. And when Donald Trump pointed them toward the Capitol and told them to fight like hell, that's exactly what they did. Donald Trump lit that fire. But in the weeks beforehand, the kindling he ultimately ignited was amassed in plain sight. That's why as part of the Select Committee's investigation, we took a hard look at whether enough was done to mitigate that risk. Our investigative teams focused on the way intelligence was gathered, shared, and assessed. We probed preparations by law enforcement agencies and security responses on the day of the attack. We followed the money to determine who paid for a number of events in the run-up to the attack and to gain a clearer understanding of the way the former president's campaign apparatus cashed in on the big lie. And we pulled back the curtain at certain major social media companies to determine if their policies and protocols were up to the challenge when the president spread a message of violence and his supporters began to plan and coordinate their descent on Washington. The select committee's conclusion on these matters, particularly dealing with intelligence and law enforcement, is consistent with our broader findings about the causes of January 6. Were agencies perfect in their preparations for January 6 and their responses as the violence unfolded? Of course not. Relevant oversight committees and watchdogs should continue to find efficiencies and improvements, some of which are laid out in committees' recommendations. But the shortfall of communications, intelligence and law enforcement around January 6 was much less about what they did or did not know. It was more about what they could not know. The President of the United States inciting a mob to march on the Capitol and impede the work of Congress is not a scenario our intelligence and law enforcement communities envisioned for this country. Prior to January 6, it was unimaginable. Whatever weaknesses existed in the policies, procedures, or institutions, they were not to blame for what happened on that day. And so, when I think about the ongoing threats, when I think about how to avoid having to confront those what-ifs. In the future, my concerns are less with the mechanics of intelligence gathering and security posture, as important as those questions are. My concerns remain first and foremost with those who continue to seek power at the expense of American democracy. What if those election officials had given in to Donald Trump's pressure? What if the Justice Department had gone along with Trump's scheme to declare the 2020 election fraudulent? What if the vice president had tried to throw out electoral votes? What if the rioters bent on stopping the peaceful transfer of power hadn't been repelled? To cast a vote in the United States of America is an act of both hope and faith. When you drop that ballot in the ballot box, you do so with the confidence that every person named on that ballot will hold up their end of the bargain. The person who wins must swear an oath and live up to it. The people who come up short must accept the ultimate results and abide by the will of the voters and the rule of law. This faith in our institutions and laws is what upholds our democracy. If that faith is broken, if those who seek power accept only the results of elections that they win, then American democracy, only a few centuries old, comes tumbling down. That's the danger. What's the solution? The committee believes a good starting point is the set of recommendations we set forth in our report, pursuant to House Resolution 503. Driven by our investigative findings, these recommendations will help strengthen the guardrails of our democracy. Beyond what we recommend, in my view and as I said during our hearings, the best way to prevent another January 6 is to ensure accountability for January 6. Accountability at all levels. 
I have confidence in our Department of Justice and institutions at the state and local level to ensure accountability under the law. As this report is released, we see those processes moving forward. But preventing another January 6 will require a broader sort of accountability. Ultimately, the American people chart the course for our country's future. The American people decide whom to give the reins of power. If this select committee has accomplished one thing, I hope it has shed light on how dangerous it would be to empower anyone whose desire for authority comes before their commitment to American democracy and the Constitution. I believe most Americans will turn their backs on those enemies of democracy. But some will rally to the side of the election deniers, and when I think about who some of those people are, it troubles me deep inside. White supremacists. Violent extremists. Groups that subscribe to racism, anti-Semitism, and violent conspiracy theories, those who would march through the halls of the Capitol waving the Confederate battle flag. These are people who want to take America backward, not toward some imagined prior greatness, but toward repression. These are people who want to roll back what we've accomplished. I believe that those who aligned with the scheme to overturn the election heeded Donald Trump's call to march on the Capitol because they thought taking up Donald Trump's cause was a way to advance their vile ambitions. That is why I did not remove my lapel pin on January 6. Our country has come too far to allow a defeated president to turn himself into a successful tyrant by upending our democratic institutions, fomenting violence, and, as I saw it, opening the door to those in our country whose hatred and bigotry threaten equality and justice for all Americans. We can never surrender to democracy's enemies. We can never allow America to be defined by forces of division and hatred. We can never go backward in the progress we have made through the sacrifice and dedication of true patriots. We can never and will never relent in our pursuit of a more perfect union, with liberty and justice for all Americans. I pray that God continues to bless the United States of America. Benny G. Thompson Chairman Forward, Vice Chair In April 1861, when Abraham Lincoln issued the first call for volunteers for the Union Army, my great-great-grandfather, Samuel Fletcher Cheney, joined the 21st Ohio Volunteer Infantry. He fought through all four years of the Civil War, from Chickamauga to Stones River to Atlanta. He marched with his unit in the Grand Review of Troops up Pennsylvania Avenue in May 1865, past a reviewing stand where President Johnson and General Grant were seated. Silas Canfield, the regimental historian of the 21st Ovi, described the men in the unit this way. Industry had taught them perseverance, and they had learned to turn aside for no obstacle. Their intelligence gave them a just appreciation of the value and advantage of free government, and the necessity of defending and maintaining it, and they enlisted prepared to accept all the necessary labors, fatigues, exposures, dangers, and even death for the unity of our nation, and the perpetuity of our institutions. 1. I have found myself thinking often, especially since January 6, of my great-great-grandfather, and all those in every generation who have sacrificed so much for the unity of our nation and the perpetuity of our institutions. At the heart of our republic is the guarantee of the peaceful transfer of power. Members of Congress are reminded of this every day as we pass through the Capitol Rotunda. There, eight magnificent paintings detail the earliest days of our republic. Four were painted by John Trumbull, including one depicting the moment in 1793 when George Washington resigned his commission handing control of the Continental Army back to Congress. Trumbull called this, one of the highest moral lessons ever given in the world. With this noble act, George Washington established the indispensable example of the peaceful transfer of power in our nation. Standing on the west front of the Capitol in 1981, President Ronald Reagan described it this way. To a few of us here today, this is a solemn and most momentous occasion and yet in the history of our nation it is a commonplace occurrence. The orderly transfer of authority as called for in the Constitution routinely takes place, as it has for almost two centuries, and few of us stop to think how unique we really are. In the eyes of many in the world, this every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. Every president in our history has defended this orderly transfer of authority, except one. 
January 6, 2021 was the first time one American president refused his constitutional duty to transfer power peacefully to the next. In our work over the last 18 months, the Select Committee has recognized our obligation to do everything we can to ensure this never happens again. At the outset of our investigation, we recognize that tens of millions of Americans had been persuaded by President Trump that the 2020 presidential election was stolen by overwhelming fraud. We also knew this was flatly false, and that dozens of state and federal judges had addressed and resolved all manner of allegations about the election. Our legal system functioned as it should, but our president would not accept the outcome. What most of the public did not know before our investigation is this, Donald Trump's own campaign officials told him early on that his claims of fraud were false. Donald Trump's senior Justice Department officials, each appointed by Donald Trump himself, investigated the allegations and told him repeatedly that his fraud claims were false. Donald Trump's White House lawyers also told him his fraud claims were false. From the beginning, Donald Trump's fraud allegations were concocted nonsense, designed to prey upon the patriotism of millions of men and women who love our country. Most Americans also did not know exactly how Donald Trump, along with a handful of others, planned to defeat the transfer of presidential power on January 6. This was not a simple plan, but it was a corrupt one. This report lays that plan out in detail, a plan that ultimately had seven parts, anticipating that Vice President Pence, serving in his role as President of the Senate, would refuse to count official Biden electoral slates from multiple states. We understood from the beginning that explaining all the planning and machinations would be complex and would require many hours of public presentations and testimony. We also understood that our presentations needed to be organized into a series of hearings that presented the key evidence for the American public to watch live or streamed over a reasonable time period, rather than rely on second-hand accounts as reported by media organizations with their own editorial biases. We organized our hearings in segments to meet that goal. Tens of millions of Americans watched. Among the most shameful findings from our hearings was this, President Trump sat in the dining room off the Oval Office watching the violent riot at the Capitol on television. For hours, he would not issue a public statement instructing his supporters to disperse and leave the Capitol, despite urgent pleas from his White House staff and dozens of others to do so. Members of his family, his White House lawyers, virtually all those around him knew that this simple act was critical. For hours, he would not do it. During this time, Law enforcement agents were attacked and seriously injured, the Capitol was invaded, the electoral count was halted and the lives of those in the Capitol were put at risk. In addition to being unlawful, as described in this report, this was an utter moral failure, and a clear dereliction of duty. Evidence of this can be seen in the testimony of his White House counsel and several other White House witnesses. No man who would behave that way at that moment in time can ever serve in any position of authority in our nation again. He is unfit for any office. In presenting all of the information in our hearings, we decided that the vast majority of our witnesses needed to be Republicans. They were. We presented evidence from two former Trump administration attorneys general, a former White House counsel, many former Trump-appointed White House, Justice Department, and Trump campaign staff, a respected former conservative judge, the former Secretary of Labor, and many others. Like our hearings, this report is designed to deliver our findings in detail in a format that is accessible for all Americans. We do so in an executive summary, while also providing immense detail for historians and others. We are also releasing transcripts and evidence for the public to review, consistent with a small number of security and privacy concerns. A section of this report also explains the legal conclusions we draw from the evidence, and our concerns about efforts to obstruct our investigation. The committee recognizes that this investigation is just a beginning, it is only an initial step in addressing President Trump's effort to remain in office illegally. Prosecutors are considering the implications of the conduct we describe in this report. As our voters. John Adams wrote in 1761, the very ground of our liberties is the freedom of elections. Faith in our elections and the rule of law are paramount to our republic. Election deniers, those who refuse to accept lawful election results, purposely attack the rule of law and the foundation of our country. As you read this report, please consider this, Vice President Pence, along with many of the appointed officials who surrounded Donald Trump, worked to defeat many of the worst parts of Trump's plan to overturn the election. This was not a certainty. 
it is comforting to assume that the institutions of our republic will always withstand those who try to defeat our constitution from within. But our institutions are only strong when those who hold office are faithful to our constitution. We do not know what would have happened if the leadership of the Department of Justice declared, as Donald Trump requested, that the election was corrupt, if Jeff Clark's letters to state legislatures had been sent, if Pat Cipollone, Jeff Rosen, Richard Donahue, Steve Engel and others were not serving as guardrails on Donald Trump's abuses. Part of the tragedy of January 6 is the conduct of those who knew that what happened was profoundly wrong, but nevertheless tried to downplay it, minimize it or defend those responsible. That effort continues every day. Today, I am perhaps most disappointed in many of my fellow conservatives who know better. Those who stood against the threats of communism and Islamic terrorism but concluded that it was easier to appease Donald Trump, or keep their heads down. I had hoped for more from them. The late Charles Krauthammer wrote, The lesson of our history is that the task of merely maintaining strong and sturdy the structures of a constitutional order is unending, the continuing and ceaseless work of every generation. This task is unending because democracy can be fragile and our institutions do not defend themselves. The history of our time will show that the bravery of a handful of Americans, doing their duty, saved us from an even more grave constitutional crisis. Elected officials, election workers, and public servants stood against Donald Trump's corrupt pressure. Many of our witnesses showed selfless patriotism and their words and courage will be remembered. The brave men and women of the Capitol Police, Metropolitan Police and all the other law enforcement officers who fought to defend us that day undoubtedly saved lives and our democracy. Finally, I wish to thank all who honorably contributed to the work of the committee and to this report. We accomplished much over a relatively short period of time, and many of you sacrificed for the good of your nation. You have helped make history and, I hope, helped right the ship. Liz Cheney, Vice Chair Endnote 1. Silas S. Canfield, History of the 21st Regiment Ohio Volunteer Infantry in the War of the Rebellion, Vrooman, Anderson, and Bateman, Printers, 1893, p. 10. Thank you for your time. Please remember to like this video, subscribe to our channel for more videos like this, and share this video with others.